Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this latest DMU research event. My name is Jackie Lobby, and I'm Pro Vice Chancellor Academic here at DMU. It's my real pleasure to chair this webinar, which focuses on the impact of COVID-19 on the behavior of children, especially in the context of Universal Children's Day. As I'm sure you know, the goal, the goal of Universal Children's Day is to improve child welfare worldwide, promote and celebrate children's rights, and promote togetherness and awareness amongst all children. Universal Children's Day has been observed since 1954, and it marks the anniversary of the adoption by the UN General Assembly of the Declaration and Convention of Children's Rights. The convention sets out a number of children's rights, such as the rights to be protected from violence and discrimination, and the rights to life, health, and education. Obviously, we have all been impacted so much by COVID-19, and in many ways, our children are feeling that impact um, really heavily in terms of their education. So today we have five expert DMU scholars who will deliver speed lectures, followed by a panel discussion, and then a Q&A session. So I'm really pleased to be able to introduce to you our first two speakers, Dr. Helen Coulthard, who is a reader in lifespan eating behavior, and Dr. Vicki Aldridge, who is a VC 2020 senior lecturer in psychology. And they'll be speaking to us about the Sensory Play Toolkit, a fun way to help children try new foods. So I'll hand over now to Helen and Vicki. Hello. Hi. So Vicky's just going to, there's a little pause while Vicky's um, uploading the slides. Um, okay. Have a yes. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to start us off. Um, as Jackie kindly introduced, we're going to talk about our sensory play toolkit, which is a fun way to help children try new foods. Um, so you're going to hear from me and from Helen today, but I'd like to start by also thanking our collaborators, so Maxine Sharp, Louise Cunliffe and Sean Ryan, um, and our wonderful illustrator, Charlie Evans. So the idea for this toolkit um, came around from uh, the particular need that we saw um, in children's eating. Um, and so the toolkit is designed to help parents with children who are seen as picky, fussy or avoidant eaters, so they tend to have Quite a restricted diet and they'll be quite particular about what they eat when they eat how they eat um, and actually this pattern of behavior is seen in really around half of the population so around half of all children at some point during childhood are considered to be picky fussy or avoidant eaters so it's, it's a highly prevalent behavior um, and it ex exists on a continuum so um, ranging from the, the, the sort of everyday um, fussiness right through to, to quite extreme um, avoidant eating and uh, eating a very restricted diet. Um, and in recent years, that has been identified as a clinical disorder, so known as Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder, or ARFID, which was first recognised by um, the American Psychological Association in the DSM in 2013. Um, and ARFID is thought to um, affect around 1% to 2% of the population, and it's a lifespan disorder, so it's not just in children. But the little that we do know, we tend to know much more about ARFID within the child population. Um, and although research is still quite limited around ARFID, and even in um, picking fussy eating, like most disorders and sort of problematic patterns of behaviour, it's fairly widely understood that early intervention is most beneficial. Um, but with, despite that knowledge, there are currently no evidenced interventions or treatment pathways for ARFID um, and there are no particular support mechanisms for parents who are struggling with, with ARFID or, or the, the slightly less severe versions of picky and fussy eating. Um, so this is kind of where we, we came in with the toolkit idea and this fits particularly well within the, the COVID-19 context because um, the, the small amount of support that parents and children were receiving was then it's taken offline. So there was a real need for means of supporting parents and children at home using accessible methods um, and cheap methods. Um, and one of the key things uh, that feeds into our toolkit is that there's often a sensory component to these sorts of eating behaviours. Um, <coughs> so children are often particularly tactile sensitive or taste sensitive. Um, and that can really cause problems around acceptance of foods. 
Um, so thinking about sensory play and food acceptance, so the, the background literature really for um, the toolkit came from theoretical and empirical research. So um, we, it's been widely identified that familiarity with a food is one of the key motivators and mechanisms for acceptance. Um, so children like what they know and they eat what they like. Um, and so any sort of intervention or support mechanism that taps into this is, is more likely to be um, successful. Um, and some additional research showed us that factors like sensory sensitivity, pressure to eat around meal times, and a lack of motivation, so just a lack of interest in food, make exposure very difficult. And it's this exposure that's needed, you know, children experiencing foods is needed to increase familiarity. Um, and Helen has uh, conducted a series of empirical um, experiments, actually looking at how um, fun techniques um, or exposure can be used to increase um, intake of things like fruits and vegetables. So um, she, uh, along with colleagues, found that making pictures or playing bingo with fruits, for example, or fruits and vegetables helped to increase tasting, despite the fact that these were non-taste uh, non exposures. So children were playing with the foods, but they weren't under any pressure to eat them. Um, and they, they still saw increased tasting compared to um, watching the same task, so not actually getting involved. Um, and additional interventions used weekly um, play with fruits and vegetables, and they were found to increase tasting more in neophobic children. So neophobia is that tendency to avoid um, and to, to fear the, the novel or the unusual, unfamiliar. <laughs> okay. So this is where our, our toolkit really comes in. Um, I'm going to leave it to Helen to actually explain a bit of a bit more about what the toolkit is, but the aims of our toolkit really were to support parents and children. And it's it's quite important to note at this point that interventions can be based on a parent's need. It's not just always about the child's needs. Um, and what we see quite often, especially with children with ARFID, is that as long as they're eating the foods they like um, and they're not being asked to eat the foods they don't like or that they fear, there's no real problem for the child. But that can actually be causing it a huge strain on parents <laughs> families because they're so restricted. So in that instance, it's often the parent that needs the support, perhaps more than the child initially. So we wanted our toolkit to empower parents, so to help give them knowledge about children's eating generally and about their own child's eating. To more information about sensory processing and how that can feed into a child's eating behaviour and the foods they'll accept. And to inspire them with some ideas about how to introduce new textures and eventually new foods. Um, we wanted to help to recognise and normalise difficulties um, and to do what well, the purpose of doing that was to help reduce anxiety in parents, which is, it seems a very big issue, um, reduce this sense of isolation and also self-blame. So um, parenting self-efficacy is often uh, very intimately tied up with, with child feeding. So the point really is that you're recognising and acknowledging that this behaviour is challenging and there is perhaps a problem, but it's not unusual or unchangeable. So that provides that sense of social support. We also wanted to support children to manage new textures of foods at a pace that's suitable for them. One of the biggest problems is often that children are rushed through this process and that can actually have the, the opposite effect. And we wanted to help make this exposure to new textures and foods fun. That was really the, the crux of it. And then at some point to increase new food acceptance. <coughs> So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Helen. Thanks a lot, Vicky. Um, so kind of based on the um, criteria that Vicky's just talked about, um, we created um, a 28 page actual kind of paper booklet. I've got one here. Um, um, and it works best actually if children and parents can write in it. Um, and um, so there's kind of three main sections to the toolkit. So first of all, um, uh, parents can profile their children so they fill in questionnaires, you know, how food neophobic their child is, so how reluctant their child is to try new foods, um, also how um, much they like engaging in different sensory substances. Um, so really kind of building up the parents' knowledge of, you know, what their child's likes and dislikes are. Um, and then the second section, um, we suggest a lot of food and non-food games. And these are based on the research that um, I have done and Vicky's done as well. 
Um, so, for example, there's um, a photo in this slide here with the Magic Snowman game where they have a recipe for making kind of magic snow out of corn flour and water and baby oil um, and then kind of making snowmen um, from it. So that's like an example of a, a non-food game. And then there's a section in the toolkit as well where they can create their own games and they can... Um, you know, decide to use certain characters or narratives that the child particularly likes um, and they can choose the substances. So there's a kind of creative element as well, uh, where the parent and the child are co-creating those games. Um, and then there's a very small section at the back. and We didn't want this to be a large part of the toolkit because we didn't want there to be a lot of pressure on children to actually eat foods. Um, so when parents are ready, they can go on to the third section of the toolkit, um, which we tell them about food chaining. So kind of choosing what is the next best food to try for their child. And it's often a food with a very small sensory change to foods that the child already likes. Um, and we have a new food challenge. And um, so this kind of paper toolkit, obviously, um, we, we had a bit of a challenge because the COVID-19 uh, and the lockdown um, occurred. Um, so we launched it as an online resource. And actually, um, this worked really, really well um, because what happened, as Vicky said, was there was a lot of um, sensory play workshops um, weren't happening anymore. Uh, professionals weren't meeting children um, one to one. So they were conducting kind of telephone or online consultations. Um, so we've had about 2,500 downloads since May, so about um, 500 a month. Um, and we've had a really good uh, professional reach. So we've had um, speech and language therapists, dietitians, special educational needs, um, support workers, psychologists download it, and they're working with quite a lot of children. Um, and then there's also been um, a very good international reach. So even though um, most of our downloads have been from the UK, we've also had a lot from Australia, but also countries from all over the world, Iceland, Zimbabwe. Uh, I just sent one to Qatar recently. Um, so we've had a very good response. And because it, we've kind of, you know, launched it as an online tool as well, it means that we've had this fantastic international reach and we've been able to support people um, globally. Um, next slide, Vicky. <laughs> Um, so we've done um, a professional evaluation so far uh, with about 70 uh, professionals uh, across 10 different countries, uh, most of them based in the UK and from a, a range of different occupations, um, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and what's fantastic is that um, the majority of these people are using the toolkit in their practice. They're changing the toolkit um, um, and particularly in COVID. So what a lot of professionals are doing because they can't see children, um, they are sending, emailing um, the toolkit to parents um, in that kind of initial consultation. And then it's something that parents and children can do at home. So potentially kind of saving time and also giving the parents something tangible to do. So that very early support that Vicky was talking about. Um, we've included um, a couple of quotes from professionals. So you can see it's kind of really helping them uh, kind of reduce the kind of consultation time because otherwise they would have to explain how to do all these things to the parent um, and also how they've used it during COVID, um, especially when their kind of groups are being cancelled as this kind of extra uh, resource for support. Okay, next slide, Vicky. Okay. OK, so um, some of the implications, I realise we're kind of running out of time a little bit. Um, I think what's really clear from the pandemic is that we sometimes have to help uh, parents and caregivers um, to help themselves. And there's a real need for these kind of low cost, engaging um, interventions that aren't relying on professionals to be there all the time. Um, so I, and I think there's a real need for this. Um, and feedback that we've had so far from professionals is that they want more toolkits, they want them for um, younger children as a kind of preventative measure, uh, for older children and adolescents um, who really suffer quite a lot socially if, they're, if they have ARFID or picky eating because it's very difficult for them to socialise if they're not eating most of the foods their friends are. 
Um, and then also because a lot of our professionals are working with children on the um, autistic spectrum, then um, to have these kind of slightly varied toolkits where um, maybe the games aren't quite as imaginative and they're more tailored uh, to children's kind of play preferences. And there are currently no nice guidelines for treating ARFID or picky eating in the UK, um, even though this diagnosis has existed for 10 years now. And there's still none of these really nice pathways um, to kind of support parents. Um, um, and we really need an evidence base for these uh, treatments, which we're currently carrying out some research on our toolkit. Um, and these kind of the kind of this evidence base will hopefully encourage uh, each policy change in this area and support parents more. Um, next slide, Vicky. Okay, just to say um, thank you for listening. Um, you can, um, if you want the copy, um, you can download the toolkit from our website, um, which is the electronic version, or if you email one of us, um, we will be quite happy to send you a complimentary paper copy. So thank you very much for listening. Oh, um, yeah, so um, we're now, I'm now going to introduce um, the next speakers. Um, so this is Sapphire Crosby, who's um, a doctoral student and uh, Professor Sarah Uni in education. Um, and they're going to talk about the fantastic germ journey. So thank you. Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you with us and it's good for us to come together to celebrate Universal Children's Day. We'd like to share with you our project that's making a difference to children's lives around the world. My name's Professor Sarah Uni, and I would like to introduce Sapphire Crosby, who, as Helen kindly said, is undertaking her PhD research on the Germs Journey project. I'd like to start by explaining how the project came about. And it actually started with one conversation and it was a conversation between a scientist and an educationalist. And that led to the project that's impacted children in the UK, India and West Africa. So it began when microbiologist Dr. Katie Laird, who's the head of infectious diseases at De Montfort University, was toilet training her son. And she realised there were very few books to help. And of those books, none at that time stressed the importance of hand washing. Now, with her being a microbiologist, she knew that was very important and her son wasn't understanding the idea of germs being on the potty and on the toilet. So we connected at Montfort University and we created an interdisciplinary research team. And our vision was to create a set of resources to help children around the world understand the concept of germs, germ transfer and why children need to wash their hands, as well as improving their actual behavioural techniques to wash their hands. So this is a story of germs journey. And I'm going to pass on to Sapphire. Okay, so as Sarah um, just said, the aim of the Germ Journey project is really to raise awareness of health hygiene for young children and to give children a better understanding of germs and hand washing. And we do this by creating interactive educational resources. So our mission really is to make Germ Journey resources freely available and at the point of access to children, educators and healthcare workers around the world. Um, so as Sarah just said, we are an interdisciplinary interdisciplinary team of academics, researchers, educators, healthcare workers and students and all of our resources are co-created with our inter international partners um, to children, teachers and parents as well. Um, so we've developed a range of educational resources including books, um, online games, posters um, for young children and also um, resources for parents and teachers to be able to educate their children as well. So the idea of co-creation was really important to us and it's interesting because Helen and Vicky talked about working with a graphic designer called Charlie Evans and the artwork you can see in front of you is also Charlie Evans work so she was a DMU student undertaking an art degree with us we had as I said the microbiologist we had myself as the educationalist we came together to create a book for young children and we were informed by child development theory so in particular, we use the work of Piaget and his theory of cognitive development. And we know from Piaget that children do not develop abstract thinking until they're about 12 years old. 
So this means for young children, they do not understand germs. Germs are invisible and abstract. So if young children cannot see them, for them, they don't exist. So for this reason, we wanted to have a visual representation of the magnifying glass to show that germs are there even if you can't see them. So we worked with students to carry on developing the project, developing the resources, and we also took the students out to India and Sierra Leone with us to create the resources relevant for those countries. And I'm going to pass back to Sapphire. Um, so as Sarah just said, we originally developed the book and the resources for the UK. Um, we were working with schools in Leicestershire and the East Midlands with the view to improve children's hand washing behaviour and understanding. But we knew that, of course, global, uh, hand washing is a global issue and we knew that it was important to target other areas as well. So with this in mind, we have developed resources for a range of countries and regions across Africa, Asia and Europe and have developed these in 10 languages so far. So our focus has been particularly on India and West Africa um, and the project is underpinned by the philosophy of co-creation and the whole ethos of the project um, centres on joint collaboration. So working with partners from a range of disciplines and a range of countries. Uh, so when we were developing the books for India and West Africa, we worked really closely with the communities and with the um, children and teachers in real, really rural areas in the Gujarat state of India and in Sierra Leone, um, because we realised that we needed to make these resources culturally authentic for their areas. Um, so we, as Sarah mentioned, we took a research trip to Sierra Leone um, last year, in uh, June last year, and we worked alongside uh, University of McKinney and we also took, um, so myself, Sarah went, and also we took a DME photography student and a English language uh, master's student as well. Um, we worked with the local teachers and children in order to see what types of pictures and information uh, that we should include in the new um, West Africa version of the book. Um, so as you can see, we um, in this page, we added um, the types of water that should be used. And this really came from one of the focus groups where when we were discussing with the teachers what sorts of information we should be using, they said that this was really, really important. Um, we also added a picture of um, a step by step guide on how to wash hands, which again um, came from the focus group and was taken by one of the DMU photography students that we took with us. Um, so as part of the project, we developed a workshop intervention using the Germs Journey resources. And this workshop takes a structured carousel approach um, in which small children, uh, small groups of children move around um, and they go to each different activity. Uh, the workshops were designed to be interactive and were underpinned by Kolb's theory of experiential learning. And as Sarah spoke about before, um, because germs are invisible and they're an abstract concept, that it's really hard for young children to grasp uh, this um, the understanding that germs are invisible and can make them ill. So it was really important that the learning is done through hands-on experience. So the activities include um, a book reading activity where we read the Germ Journey book with the children. Um, we have online games, we have uh, colouring sheets, and we have a um, glow in the gel, a glow dark, glow gel activity for children where we put glow in the dark gel on their hands. Uh, we then shine a UV light over it, exposing the germs and um, they, we then ask them to wash their hands and see the areas that they maybe may have missed. We also have a colouring activity and another activity which isn't actually on this slide, but we have a hand washing song video that we co-created with the Think Tank Museum, which um, is a fun song which just tells children the types of uh, the areas on their hands that they should be targeting when they wash their hands. Um, so the research we have carried out um, has shown significant improvements in young children's understanding of germ transfer and the relationship between germs and illness, both in the UK and India. Um, so the workshops that um, I just spoke about um, have been delivered to, UK, to the UK and in India, as well as workshops for teachers as well. Um, and we were able to carry out data collection to measure the effectiveness of the resources using these uh, workshop interventions. So findings from a questionnaire showed that 80 to 100 percent of parents and teachers who took part in a workshop in Leicestershire in 2017 said that the resources were successful in aiding children's knowledge of teacher supporting and increased understanding um, since their pupils have participated in the workshop. We then co-developed alongside EYFS teachers a worksheet for children to compare, uh, sorry, to complete, to measure their level of understanding both before the workshop and then again after the workshop. So um, we found that as a direct result of the workshops in uh, 2019, 
uh, sorry, earlier this year in 2020, sorry, there was a 40% increase in children's germ transfer knowledge immediately after the intervention. And then this improved knowledge was actually sustained um, up to one month after the intervention with a 30% increase in understanding. Um, so since 2017, alongside um, organisations and charities, the Germ Journey team have also conducted workshops with 624 children and have trained 216 teachers in India, um, with 5,207 children being taught using the Germ Journey resources by teachers who had been um, trained by the Germ Journey team previously. So results from school and community centre workshops um, in India in 2017 showed that two months after participating, 60-73% of children knew how germs could cause illness, and then 76-80% uh, uh, knew how to remove germs um, two months after participating in the workshops. Um, in January 2019, um, children's workshops using the Gujarat book were then um, conducted in India, and 55% of these children had an increased understanding following the workshops. And it's important to note that the children taking part in these workshops were from areas of severe deprivation, um, and the charity that we worked with referred to them as having very low levels of literacy. So having a 55% increase in understanding um, was a really positive result for us. So after measuring the effect that the resources have on children's understanding, the next step was then to measure the effects that they have on hand washing behaviour. So two re research studies were carried out um, in which children were observed washing their hands before and after either having watched a um, hand washing song video that I spoke about earlier in the Think Tank Museum or in schools when they uh, took part in hand washing uh, workshops using the, um, all of the resources. So for the first study, after watching the hand washing song video at the Think Tank Museum, results found that children engaged in significantly more areas of their hands than those who did not see the video, with 53% of children washing in between fingers in the intervention group compared to 25 in the control group. And then similarly, on the second study, which um, was the traditional workshops completed in schools, findings from the observation showed that children contacted significantly more areas of the hands again, both immediately after the intervention and then following a one month delay um, compared to baseline measures. Um, so in February 2020, we then went back to India in order to see what effect the resources have had on uh, teachers since we first started working with them in 2017. And during a focus group of teachers in India who had previously been trained uh, using the German Journey resources, 100% um, of these teachers reported that actually since using the resources, the children have disseminated their knowledge to their families and the wider community, uh, which has actually resulted in a reduction in illness um, associated with diarrhea and vomiting uh, with children within the communities. So then vol following this really positive result from the teachers in India, our next step now is working with um, hospitals in the UK in order to measure the effect that the resources have on children's infection rates. So we have secured NHS ethics to conduct the research in paediatric wards in hospitals, which is expected to commence, commence this year. So we are very excited about that. And I will just hand you now on to Sarah to close uh, this talk. Thank you, Sapphire. When we started this work, as I said, this conversation between a scientist and a social scientist at the university, this was four years ago, and we had no idea that a global pandemic was looming. What we have realised is with COVID-19 is that hand washing remains more important than ever, and also particularly for very young children in schools, where we know that there's a lot of physical contact. We also know that the World Health Organization continues to stress the importance of hand washing as being one of the most effective measures to continue to contain COVID-19. So we welcome all of you that are listening today to please share these resources. They are free to all. They're on the website, which you can see um, we've put on the slide for you. You're also warmly invited to become involved in any of the research we're doing. We are open to anyone that would like to use the resources or to undertake doctoral research with us. The project is ongoing and this is a warm invitation to you. I'd like to thank you for your time for listening and I'm going to pass on to Aaron Toogood, who I'm also pleased to say is another one of my PhD students and uh, it's a delight to pass on to Aaron. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to begin my presentation uh, by showing you a particular uh, political cartoon. 
Now, it's, it's not funny. I don't think it's meant to be funny. But what it does do, it, it informs us very well um, uh, about what this term I've got on the slide, intergenerational transmission, actually means. What you can see is that um, the parents of a child are handing on, um, are transmitting between generations either riches or uh, poverty. And data from about 10 years ago showed that around 50% of children born in the US into low income families will end up being low income adults themselves. And in the UK, that was about 40%. Um, and as the inequality in a society increases, so does that transmission. So does um, uh, that tendency of poverty being passed from one generation to another. Now, if we have a look at the impact uh, of this um, transmission of this poverty, uh, there, there's lots on the slide. I'm not really going to um, go into detail, but we can see that inequality in a, in a young person's life will impact on their educational attainment, their well-being as an adult, their income, even their mobility. Um, and even their psychosocial um, adjustment. And Ferguson concluded um, that children born in socially disadvantaged families will have poorer health, education, and general welfare. So this places the conditions of a person's birth, the postcode of their first home, if you like, as being the single biggest factor determining many of their life outcomes. So what makes this so persistent, um, this um, transmission of poverty? There was an article on the BBC website about a year ago um, in which the director of one of the OECD's think tanks came to the UK and gave a presentation. And in that, um, from his research, he showed that when you spoke to a seven-year-old about what their career ambitions were, and then um, spoke to that same child 10 years later when they were 17, the ambitions hadn't really changed. And so what this means is that when children are year three, year four at primary school, they have already made decisions um, based upon what they're going to do when they're older. Um, and those decisions are very, very difficult to change. So my research involved going into a number of different primary schools, primarily in deprived areas of Leicester, and interviewing and administering questionnaires to year four um, pupils. And then I went back into the same to the same classes when they were at the end of year five, and then again at the end of year six to try and see whether there were any trends and how these aspirations um, evolved. And I just want to share with you just a few of the results. So the, the first diagram I'd like to show you is to do with um, how optimistic some of these children were. Now, I don't want to go too much into the data, to be honest. I'm really just wanting to talk about the trends today. But each of those colored dots represents um, a particular group of careers that have something in common. For example, the yellow dot represents careers that are sort of clerical in nature, like accountant or um, working in a bank partic particularly. And you'll see that on each diagram, there are two dots the same color, one with an arrow pointing to the second. The first dot is uh, the data that was obtained when the children were in year four, and the second dot uh, when they were in year six. And so you can see this journey uh, that their aspirations are taking. Now, um, th there are two charts on the slide. The first one refers to um, the children who feel very uh, good about their own academic ability. They have a high level of self-belief, whereas the chart on the right are children whose self-belief academically is very low. What we can see is that if we just look at the year four data points, there isn't really any significant difference at that age. But as they move from year four into year six, when all of the pressure of assessment and everything comes on them, the children who feel good about themselves have higher optimism. In order to interpret these charts, if the data points move up 
and to the right, that's implying greater levels of optimism. As we move down and to the left towards the origin of these charts, that's moving into the realms of what's called hopelessness, where the children feel that it doesn't matter whether they try at school or not, they're not going to be successful. And what we can see is that the children with low um, with low levels of self-belief, feel hopeless in, um, with regards to many careers as they leave primary school and move into the difficult, challenging um, environment of high school. If we move from their level of optimism to their um, level of motivation and how determined they are, there's a, sim a similar diagram, but again, we've got different um, variables on the axes. But uh, again, as we move up and to the right from year four to year six, it's showing that the children are having increased levels of um, motivation and determination. Whereas down and to the left towards the origin, again, shows that um, what motivation was there previously is eroding. Now, we're looking at the same groups of children, those who have um, a high opinion of their academic ability and those who with low uh, feelings of self-belief or self-efficacy. And what we can see again from the data is those who have this confidence in themselves um, have this growing sense of motivation, growing sense of determination that they're going to go out and change the world and they're going to be what they want to be, that they're going to cross that divide from poor to rich. Whereas those with uh, lower levels of self-belief, we can see that again, the motivation is eroding. Um, and so there's more and more likely um, that people, um, that these young children are going to end up simply repeating um, the lives maybe that their parents have had, again, increasing this tendency of intergenerational transmission. Now, just to move to a, a few quotes that I got from, uh, took from some of the transcripts of interviews that were done. Um, so I've got a number of them here. And again, um, you get children talking and it's difficult to get them st to stop. But here's just a few quotes that I thought highlighted a few issues that are uh, popping up in my analysis. The first one is from a um, year six boy, so 10 or 11. Um, and what it highlights to me is that even at this age, he is aware of um, economic disadvantage in his life. He was bemoaning the fact that he's not very good at commute, uh, computing, but that's because they don't have a computer in their home, whereas other children who do are going to be better at it than him. Okay, at this young age, he is becoming aware of where he sits in the social structure of society. The second quote um, illuminates sort of the unrealistic view that some children have of particular careers. And also it gives an implication as to where they may be getting their ideas from. This young boy um, was saying that all a police officer does is fire pistols at people who are doing something wrong. Now, for one, in the UK, we don't really <laughs> see too many firings of pistols, but you do see that on television and in the movies. So these young children are, are being influenced by what they view on television. I'm not sure kids watch television anymore, whatever they see streaming or on YouTube or whatever media they have access to. So a lot of their understanding of possible roles is drawn from electronic media. The, the third quote, I think, was... Um, quite shocking in a way that this there was a young girl who um, who made the statement that even at year six, um, 10 and 11, these gender stereotypes are deeply entrenched, where she said that women take care of the kids and most men go to work. So even at this very early age, girls are big, in, in deprived areas are, very, are beginning to feel um, very um, sort of caged in as to their options. The final, fra uh, the final comment was related to this 
um, sense of danger and worry that a lot of children have about particular careers. So this one boy, when talking about uh, being an aircraft pilot, thought that it might be quite cool to travel and visit different places. But on the flip side, he didn't want to kill people. And so it made me reflect upon the disproportionate amount of times when we watch TV or movies that things go wrong on planes, um, that police officers are shooting people and so on. Some tentative conclusions um, that I've come to, just to try and wind uh, this presentation up. Um, definitely at a younger age, children need access to good information about what careers involve. Ideally, uh, it should be embedded within the national curriculum in some form. Um, certainly for young girls, um, they need more role models of the of a lot of these occupations so that they know that it is a possibility for them. Um, and, and as we looked at the, the data on the chart earlier, uh, the self-belief that a child has needs to be nurtured and supported rather than crushed and squashed by these kind of year six sats and the months and months of lead up mocks that they, they need to go through as a result of the government metrics they have for these primary schools. And then finally, I didn't really have an opportunity to talk about my interaction as it, with the university with um, primary school children, but where the more primary school children spend, uh, time they spend with universities, um, the greater um, their aspirations tend to be for professional careers and tertiary education. Thank you for um, uh, listening um, today, and I hope that some of what I've said has rung true with maybe your experience as a young person or maybe um, your children's experience. I'm now going to pass over to Beth Miller, um, who's another colleague from my faculty, who's also full-time academic but doing some doctoral study um, on the side, and she's going to be talking to us about the resilience of teachers. Thank you very much, Aaron. Hello, um, I'll just wait for my slides. Um, this research is, is actually taking it from a different angle because um, obviously teachers have a big effect on children and their learning. So this is looking at the resilience of teachers um, that manage to stick it out, an exploration of the notion that teacher resilience is the key to addressing the teacher attrition rates. Next slide, please, Krishna. This research aims to discover through exploration of the stories of serving teachers and teaching professionals is whether the key to addressing higher teacher attrition rates is to ensure that those entering the profession are trained to be resilient. According to the figures from the DFRE in 2019, there were 43,406 full-time equivalent teachers that entered the profession in England. But in that same year, 39,675 left. And from the exiting figure, only 5,979 of those were retiring. This, inevit this inevitably disrupts the learning and progression of students and the staff cohesion within schools. What this research aims to explore is whether these attrition rates are high because teachers do not have sufficient resilience or whether there are other factors that contribute to the annual mass exodus from the profession. It aims to explore whether there are factors that create barriers to teacher resilience that, aim, that need addressing and more investment rather than resilience development. My motivation for this research comes from my professional background as a teacher. Throughout my 23 years as a teacher and school leader, I was acutely aware of the high degree of teacher absence and attrition and I witnessed the impact it had on student behaviour and progression. Having experience in schools that had a, a low deprivation measure and those that had a high deprivation measure, I was aware the turnover was greater where deprivation was higher. I am motivated to explore whether my experience is unique or more commonplace. What my personal experience has indicated, however, 
is the need to address this problem to ensure that all students are getting the level of education they are entitled to. The research seeks to explore whether in-service teachers' resilience, resilience development is important for members of the teaching profession, what teachers understand to be resilient, and the barriers that they perceive hinder resilience, for example, a lack of autonomy, professional trust and respect. Further, it seeks to investigate the reasons teachers believe their colleagues opt to leave the profession before retirement age. Next slide, please, Krishna. Christopher Day, either independently or in conjunction with other academics, has focused on the issue of teacher resilience and he generally advocates that it is a key characteristic for being a successful teacher. However, his work also points to barriers that impact on teachers' resilience, such as leadership and workplace culture being two of the most important factors identified by Day. He further indicates in his work that the constant external scrutiny and accountability emphasised by the media wears away at teacher resilience, resulting in stress and burnout. The work of Day has influenced the direction of this research. <clears throat> Much of the research in regard resilience hasn't been specifically applied to the teaching profession, although the work has, that has related to teaching echoes the bulk of the resilience research. Some of the phrases that have been associated with resilience our bounce back ability, coping, stoicism, reflective and motivated. This demonstrates the complexities regarding resilience and the need for clarity. There appears to be more consensus regards the barriers to resilience, but also within the research listed, these are, the also, these are also reasons provided for teacher attrition, therefore posing the question, Will relying on teacher training to create resilient teachers as they enter the profession, in actuality, reverse the tide of high attrition? If other aspects of the profession aren't addressed simultaneously. Next slide, please, Karishna. To understand what is happening in contemporary schools and to inform my thinking, I intend to use critical theory. This theory allows a reflection on the narrative that is being divulged by the participants and the identification of the barriers and problems that prevent teachers from longevity within the profession. It will provide a theoretical basis for exploration of the policies and procedures that potentially inhibit the freedoms of the teacher's professional judgments that as a consequence demotivate and can result in the early departure from the profession. Glazer, you'll notice, rejects the notion, <clears throat> excuse me, rejects the notion that teachers leave the profession because they lack resilience, but rather that it is a reaction to a lack of freedoms due to the constraints of those within power. Next slide, please, Karishna. <clears throat> A, con a, a, excuse me. <coughs> a constructionist approach to research supports this particular research. It also allows for the examination of the research area by the constructionalism develop development of jointly, uh, excuse me, I'm losing my voice. <laughs> Sorry, I do apologize. Constructed understandings of the world from the basis of the lived experience, thereby allowing in-service teachers at the chalk face to tell their story and through their transcript construct reality in regards resilience and attrition. The qualitative research allows for exploration and opportunity to listen to the real life stories of teachers at the chalk face. Next slide, please, Karishta. <clears throat> These are the preliminary findings so far. Um, I've only at the moment had managed to start um, the investigation and we spoke to about 10 teachers, but there is an interesting pattern that's emerging. 
um, one of the interesting things that seems to emerge is that teachers have to be resilient to teach is what they're saying. Uh, this is needed from the onset and all teachers believe that they are resilient. Teachers exit the profession because their resilience has been eroded because they are not they are stressed and tired. Teachers stress that tiredness is the is, tiredness is the result of a lack of respect and trust, a lack of recognition, a negative relationship with the media, top down pressures, pupil behavior, excessive accountability and the fallacy that one size fits all approach to educational policy. Teachers who stress the importance of people relationship and leadership type with the individual school, teachers are more likely to quit the toxic school. Teachers interpret resilience as being able to cope, bounce back, bounce back ability to be able to keep going and being reflective in your practice. Most teachers though do believe that they have autonomy, but interestingly state that when the door is closed, I do my own thing, but when I'm being observed, I stick to the prescribed ways to teach. Interestingly, emergence um, theme that I will continue to look out for throughout this investigation is this notion of the toxic school. However, there does appear to be some clarity currently on what resilience is for teachers. Interestingly, has been overwhelmingly belief by teachers that they are by nature resilient and you cannot teach if you are not resilient. Early indications, therefore, that attrition is the result of other issues that cause the erosion of resilience. Preliminary findings are also indicating the negative impact for schools, teachers and children of the COVID pandemic. Having a similar impact on teacher confidence and morale as, as a less than satisfactory Ofsted outcome uh, was said one of the participants. For health and safety and general well-being, school leaders are having to make more a more directive approach to leadership, reducing teacher autonomy. And a considerable amount of leadership time is being taken to complete the track and trace systems. These are only three of the issues reported. There are a lot more. One positive, uh, one positive belief by teachers is that they do have slightly more respect and trust from parents because of them having to teach their own children during the first lockdown. lockdown. Next slide, please, Krishna. So what this um, investigation is hoping um, to contribute to knowledge is to identify topics for discussion for future research that aims to have an impact on policy, to build on existing resilience literature and research by providing a context within the schools, to build on existing literature and research on teacher attrition by exploring potential link between personal resilience and teacher stickability, and to explore more and introduce this notion of the toxic school. Next slide, please, Krishna. Um, thank you very much for listening, and I will now hand back to Jackie Labby. Thank you very much to Beth and to all of our speakers. I think uh, we had a, a really interesting sequence of, of talks there that took us through a lot of really important um, issues that are so vital, I think, to our, our children's upbringing and to their, their strong development. Um, we've got some time now to have a, a panel discussion. So I would invite uh, the speakers to join me virtually on the stage, so to speak, so that we can uh, have a little bit of a panel talk. I'll just wait for them all to arrive. So welcome back, everybody. Um, so we've got probably about uh, 10 minutes or so to have a panel discussion. And I thought um, it might be really interesting maybe to hear from all of you um, 
how you felt COVID-19 was actually having a direct impact on some of the things that you have researched. So we've, we've heard a little bit of that from, from all of you, but I think in terms of the background research that you have done and any uh, thoughts you might have about the impact on, on, the, on your work that COVID-19 might bring, um, just maybe if we just go in the in the order that we heard the talks in. So maybe um, Helen and Vicky, I mean, I, for instance, would be particularly interested to hear um, if you think there might be anything around um, the lockdown, for instance, and possibly the the lack of accessibility to certain foods that might have, might contribute to or exacerbate some of the things that you were describing. Um, yeah, well, we're actually carrying out some research at the moment about that. So um, because we have a PhD student who's specifically looking at parenting um, children with Hickey and Arfid, and she's got data from before lockdown. So and the COVID-19 pandemic. So that'll be interesting. Um, Vicky and I know quite a few clinical psychologists as well who work with children um, with these issues. And I think uh, one thing that I think is probably relevant um, to a lot of the speakers to talk about is actually that for some children, um, COVID-19 was quite an anxious time. Um, things were changing, things were different, you know, their, their usual routines were upset. And because um, picky eating behaviour behavior is very strongly associated with anxiety, um, then you can understand uh, for some children it would ex exacerbate their symptoms. And there are some children that are having an onset of problems as well um, as part of a kind of anxiety response. So I think that issue can't be understated and that people actually need more support even though a lot of those kind of support channels have been disrupted. Um, I don't know if you wanted to say anything else, Vicky. Um, I was just going to really reflect on Jackie's particular point about food availability, and it's yeah. an thing that we're sort of interested in, particularly for children at the very extreme end of the spectrum with the more ARFID um, disorder type eating behaviours. They're often eating sort of fewer than 10 different foods. Um, and that's by foods we, we often mean a particular flavour of a particular brand of crisps um, might be one of their foods. Um, and so there's often a fear around brands changing recipes, changing labels, particularly with the, the overlap with children on the autism spectrum. Um, so, uh, you know, safety is projected through how a food looks and how it smells and how it tastes. So I imagine that particularly early in the pandemic when there was a lot of panic buying and, and food was much more scarce. I certainly anecdotally would, would suggest that that was an anxious time for parents and children who may have been old enough to be aware that those foods might become much less available. So yeah, it's very likely that it would have had a, a the direct impact as well as the, the uh, slightly more indirect impact. It's really interesting, and I, I, because we've had various stories about very people doing newly domesticated things around food production, for instance, more home baking, and you know maybe a more of an emphasis on on small vegetable plots and things like that. Is there an opportunity there? Do you think maybe for in this area to, you know, in a way, acclimatize kids to to where food comes from and how they can actually have control over the Say the production of their own food. Do you think there might be something in there that maybe almost a, a kind of benefit? It's hard. We always we want to find some benefits from COVID. Do you think there might be that might actually help kids? I think people are, um, especially during the first lockdown, they were cooking a lot more at home. They were baking. I don't think that's true maybe for all families, but I think s some people were definitely doing more of those things and growing their own foods. And I think that would be a very positive thing for all children. Um, whether it's really interesting, so these kind of be these coping behaviours that uh, a lot of people generated, especially during the first lockdown, um, it would be very interesting to see if they sustain over time when our kind of norm normal environments kind of open again. Are people still going to be baking a lot of banana bread, um, or are they going to be going back to the the cafe? So. Yeah, it, I mean, we're, we're carrying out some research on it, so it will be actually really interesting to see if things like these children who are quite picky, whether they are actually doing a bit more home cooking or whether they're doing something else during lockdown. Um, but yeah, no, it's a really good point. 
Thank you very much. And when I turn to, to Sarah and Sapphire, obviously hand washing is now a thing in a way that probably has never been outside, say, you know, clinical medical kind of practices in the past. So do you think, is there something that you might be able to say about has, in, has, has COVID in a way made the discussion around hand washing any easier um, because of the way it's so prevalent, so obvious for everybody now? Thank you, Jackie. Yes, it's certainly raised the profile of the importance of hand washing. What we found with the outbreak at the very beginning in March and April was that one of our partners is VSO International. That stands for Volunteers Overseas, and they work with uh, low income countries. And uh, we would have regular webinars with them. And they said that our posters where we've got very clear step-by-step -step guides on what to do for hand-washing behavior. They asked us to create a template so they could then distribute it to those countries for the countries to then put it in their own language. So that was one activity that we did straight away um, because Safa's already said we'd done 10 languages, but obviously for global reach, we needed a template for lots of languages. So that was one thing we did. Um, Safa, is there anything else that you'd want to say? Um, no, <laughs> no, I think you've asked it already. Um, again, obviously, we've we've known the hand washing obviously been, has been an issue for, forever, but um, but obviously with this, the kind of importance of hand washing has really been seen. It's gaining traction, and it, so to speak. Um, I was thinking another resource that we found really helpful was that we were invited by the Science Museum in Birmingham to create a permanent display. So one of the levels in the museum has been put over to uh, the germs journey and we did a co-collaborative video of a song and it was a hands and action song and we've done that out in India and done that in Gujarati for children and our next step with Sierra Leone would be to produce those kinds of experiential learning so we know we've got the happy birthday here which is based on nudge theory from psychology which is well you already hand wash you already know happy birthday do it twice uh, we found that having children do the step-by-step action songs was another really effective way to get children to do it and to do it more effectively and more properly with the techniques for hand washing. Thank you very much. Erin, if I could turn to you. Um, although we unfortunately couldn't see your slides during your talk, I think you, you did a masterful job of, of, um, of describing in a way what the slides would have shown us. And um, it, it made me wonder in terms of things like the, the roles that people feel that they're already being in a way trained into or expecting in life, whether they're, they're career roles, gender roles, um, and how aspirations apply to that. Do you think that, that the experience that we're all living under within COVID is, is reifying these structures and roles? Um, you know, in the way we've heard, for instance, how, how much of the pressure to keep the home life going has fallen on women um, and has had an impact on their working life, et cetera. So could you say maybe a little bit more about that? Are, are we actually seeing a reification of these structures and a, a limiting of aspirations? <laughs> It's quite interesting. This morning, uh, BBC Radio um, were visiting one of the primary schools I work with um, because it's International Children's Day. And they were talking to some of the children about careers and ambitions and so on, and a couple of the teachers. And what, what, what's surprising is that there seem to be a lot of children now that want to be scientists and a lot of teachers that want a lot of children that want to be teachers. And it goes back to this idea of where they get their ideas from as to what they want to be when they're older. Because at the moment, scientists um, are at the, at the forefront of everything that seems to be going on at the moment. So the, there seems to be a lot of excitement. Um, I don't think they st still quite understand what it means, but um, that there seems to be a, a, lot, um, a lot of drive with the children. So their interest seems to be affected by the current situation. And also with regards to teachers, well, outside of their homes, teachers are the only real adults that they're interacting with at the moment. Um, so it, it kind of reaffirms the need for um, children to be exposed in a very real and sensible and constructive way to the whole range of um, different career possibilities that are out there. I suppose one challenge is that by the time these eight-year-olds are in the workforce, whole new industries will have been created which don't even exist now. So it is, it, it's more 
about children just being open, remaining open to whatever possibilities arise. But certainly in these COVID days, it is becoming very insular. Everybody's in a bubble, aren't they? Everybody seems to be contained within a smaller group, so they're not necessarily getting the exposure that they need to the to the the real world and the different options that are there. So I, I think that's making it potentially problematic. It's limiting their view on what they can offer to the world. Mm, thank you for that. And by by um, giving us that that sense of teachers as being one of the more visible professions to our children, it's a lovely segue back to Beth. Um, in terms of this, the the immense pressures that teachers are under now, you know, more so than ever before to, and teachers really at every level, because obviously we feel it at universities as well, to teach differently, to make sure things keep going in, in the right kind of, of pace, to ensure that students can learn what they didn't get a chance to learn and make up um, at speed and the rest of it. Um, how do you think we might be able to help teachers um, and how might your research you think give us ideas about how we can try to maybe arrest uh, the, the, gr the greater risks to attrition more effectively? You're still on mute Beth. Okay uh, what I'm finding so far Jackie um, from the teachers is that they are all really trying to change their pedagogy uh, to support student learning uh, and children's learning at the moment. Um, I, I think the teachers that are teaching subjects like maths and English and science are finding it a lot easier to do than the teachers with the arts subjects. Um, I, I, and th throughout my research that has struck me more that um, the online teaching is supporting the more academic type lessons but the more art site subject, it, the the online learning isn't very supportive. So those teachers are, are, fine, are becoming more stressed, more so than the the other teachers. Uh, and it, it's it's I'm trying to find a way that they can support. Um, one teacher was talking to me about she she was doing um, the sewing, the needlework, and when they were bringing in their projects that she wasn't able to actually go over and help. She was having to try and explain how to do the stitch from a distance. So yes, this, this is uh, affecting their resilience. And they've also, a um, lot of schools at a secondary level have changed their timetables as well, uh, from having the five sessions during a day to three sessions a day, which are extremely long. So they're having to look at more uh, innovative ways of maintaining motivation, which you know will have a positive impact in the end, because it's thinking how do we motivate students more? But currently, it, it's impacting on, on their resilience. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, we now have some time for questions from our audience, and I believe we're going to be able to um, display those questions on the screen for everybody to see. I'll just wait a minute for the first one to come up. Um, great, so, and we've, we've even very helpfully directed the, pre-directed the question. So for Sarah and Sapphire, um, first of all, praise excellent collaborative work. Has there been any examples of children becoming over anxious or worried about germs and ways to balance this? Thanks, Teresa, for that great question. Um, it's interesting because we haven't had actually any examples or reports of that from any of the parents or teachers we've worked with. Um, that doesn't mean to say it isn't happening. What we were hoping with the project is that the locus of control stays with the child and stays with the adults, whereby what we're saying is that the hand washing is the action and the solution to taking the germs away and in the book we have bye bye germs and bubbles where they're literally going down the plug hole to say to the child this isn't something to be anxious about there are germs but we wash them away there's soap there's water and that's what we do and also we feel it's really important that not all germs are bad and we don't want children to be anxious about germs. So we've developed a couple of other activities that Sapphire is going to talk about with our funky facts game. Over to you, Sapphire. I um, 
a game where we have little germ characters with faces, um, either smiley faces or frown faces. And the idea is that children will um, print these out and they will be stuck in different areas of the room and they have to decide whether they think the germs are bad or good. And on the germs, they have statements. So, for example, I think one of them said um, the germs in yogurt or certain types of food which obviously helps with digestion and things like that. So it's sort of really trying to um, reassure children that obviously there are some germs that are bad and they will make you ill if you don't wash your hands. But also we do need germs and we shouldn't be scared of germs because they are good for us as well, as long as we wash our hands and um, and are careful about putting our hands in our mouths and things like that. Um, we can have control over the situation. And also we've um, in the back of our books and on our parent and teacher guides, we have information about good germs and um, prompts for parents and teachers to be able to te uh, talk to their children about uh, reassuring them that there, obviously there are good germs as well and we don't need to be scared as long as we are just careful with washing our hands. And, and the you. other thing to say is we've also developed a new book about viruses to show uh, this answers Jackie's question as well about COVID-19 is that a virus and a bacteria are different and we're hoping that the second book is explaining that difference because inside each of the books there's tips for parents and tips for teachers and there's some scaffolded questions and ways that parents and teachers can interact with the book alongside a small child with them. So with the virus book it's about obviously what we need to do with catching our sneezes and our coughs so we're also hoping that that will help as well in the education around this. Thank you. I think there's probably quite a few adults who need that kind of, of re-education as well, isn't there? Uh, can we have the next question, please? So for Erin, what particular interventions do you suggest should be made to increase children's aspirations? Okay, thanks. Um, I, I think the, the best place to look is um, there's, a, there's a charity called Education and Employers. So I think it's this education and employers one word dot org. If you just have a look at that, it's an organization that's set up to help children get exactly this, to understand more about particular careers. You can sign up as a volunteer in which they'll use you um, and your particular career um, and you'll record something or visit schools and give talks about what your role involves. Or you can sign up as a teacher and register your school and get access um, to all of these free resources. But wh where this sits in the national curriculum is really in uh, PSHE. You know, the E stands for economics. And it, but, but unfortunately, looking at the curriculum, it, it, the c career and career guidance and education isn't really there. And maybe that's a part of the curriculum that needs, needs to be developed and certainly needs to be looked at. So that it becomes a part of these um, weekly sessions that you have in your particular schools. But um, f for me, go to um, Education and Employers, charity, lots of great work, lots of great resources. Thank you very much, Erin. Can we have the next question, please? So for Beth, how is your research being disseminated? What difference do you hope that it will make to the teaching profession? Okay, um, thank you, that's a very good question. Um, currently, uh, it's not being disseminated, it's really much in its infancy and in the data collection stage at the moment. Uh, but eventually when it's all um, finished and put together, um, I'm hoping that it will have some impact on policy um, and on some consultancy work for schools. The difference I'm hoping it will make um, is through consultancy work with schools um, that it will help the school management to maintain and retain their teachers, which will obviously have the positive knock on effect for the progression of, of children's learning. OK, thank you. Do we have another question? Pregnant pause. So for Erin again, any recommendations to rebalance and increase aspiration uh, aspiration um, for young adults, uh, maybe including issues around self-belief? That, that, that's, a, that's a really tough one. Um, what, one of my sons is in year 10 at the moment, and he's not quite sure what he wants um, 
what he wants to do um, as a job. And I don't know how many times I've told him, like, once this is over, we'll go to a career fair because all of those great events where you can experience lots of different things have all been put aside. And all he's doing is Googling how much this job gets paid and this job gets paid. Um, so so it, it, it is difficult. The, the, the key is exposure and trying to find um, careers that match with their interests. But in terms of self-belief, what a what a difficult challenge that is. If, if you asked a teenager to write, make a list of everything that was said to them within a particular day, how many of those statements would be positive and how many would be negative? How much of all of the social me media they interact with, how much of that is giving them positive reinforcement of who they are and how much is trying to either tear them down or have them try and align with a worldview? Um, so all, all in terms of self-belief, we've just got to be positive with these kids and let them know that they're valued for who they are and then it's, and, and then try and find things that engage with their interests. And then uh, hopefully once they catch the vision of something which matches what they enjoy or might like to do, then, then hopefully it's a virtuous cycle from that point. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so uh, there's, uh, we've got time for one last question, and, and I think um, I'm going to take Chair's privilege and, and ask that question. I'd, I'd like to take us back to our, our first two speakers, to, to Helen and Vicky. And, and towards the end of your talk, um, you were talking about the, the virtual dissemination that you've turned to as a result of COVID. And I just wondered if you um, felt that that is something that would be valuable to keep going with in order to might expand the reach of your work. I think you might be on mute. Um. I think because we've had such a, a widespread dissemination and I think there's professionals working in lots of different countries. I think actually um, it forced us into a route that's actually quite beneficial for um, a lot of clinicians who are working um, abroad. Um, where you know unless you've got some kind of distribution network of your materials it becomes um quite hard to uh, disseminate um so in some ways that was a, a positive mm -hmm. that it kind of forced us down that route um yeah, yeah i would say so you got anything to add vicky or uh, no well all i was going to say is that obviously when we designed the toolkit it was very much as a a physical resource so that children could be filling bits in and parents could be filling bits in and I I do maybe personal preference for me I do still like it as the the primary mode of the resource yeah. but as Helen said I mean I don't think we could have imagined how quickly and how far it, it would reach um in being forced to sort of launch online and I, you know as long as people can access the resource for free and they're able to download and print it if they want to um, and they can still use it in the same way, even if it's not exactly how we intended. So I think there's definite um, positives to continuing with that that option as well as now being able to offer the hard copies. And just that there is such a need for it as well, that there just is absolutely nothing out there. And professionals are quite often scratching their heads, not knowing what to do um, with these children. So um, I think they've kind of really welcomed it, which has been fantastic. Thank you very much for that. I think um, in many ways, you know, even in an event like today, we are, I think we're able to reach a, a larger audience, a more far-flung audience um, in this version of, of disseminating research than in the standard kind of maybe a, a smaller conference um, or, you know, everybody having to travel to a, a specific location. So I just would like to uh, start to draw this to a close now. First of all, I very much want to thank all of our speakers, Helen, Vicky, Sarah, Sapphire, Aaron, and Beth for a series of really interesting talks um, and really just kind of the, the thrust of everything that you said, I think was, was so interesting for us and fits so well within the, the theme of Universal Children's Day, as well as the, the way in which our research is being impacted by COVID. Thank you as well to our audience for coming along and for the questions that you posed. Um, we didn't get to every single question, but um, we can certainly get the answers out to those questioners um, if you if you want to get in touch about that. So um, our next event in this series is on the 2nd of December, 
Um, it coincides with the International Day for the Abolition of Slavery. And the, the overarching theme will be slavery from the global to the local and from the historical to the modern. And I very much hope that you will be able to come back again and hear more from our, our excellent DMU researchers and doctoral students, um, sometimes one in the same, and, uh, and really to hear the, the kinds of things that people would like to, to share about the research that they're doing in that particular area. So do please join us on the 2nd of December. Um, thank you again very much for coming along for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, thank you as well to Craig for IT support. We couldn't have done it without him. And uh, I hope everybody does have a very lovely weekend and maybe it'll even stop raining if it's raining where you are. Thanks very much, everybody. Bye. Okay.